uh, way back in 2018, when me and my homeboy, Jason Bailey in San Antonio, Texas started doing these events, we answered the call of a black owned business owner, a, a black owned business, Mark's Outing Burgers in San Antonio, Texas, who was struggling to stay in business. And so we decided to support him by hosting this event with a local state representative. And we brought out about like 30, 40 young black professionals in San Antonio, Texas to support this business. And since COVID-19, we have expanded to our virtual sessions that we have at least once a month. And I'm, I'm just honored to be here with these black entrepreneurs, these black adventurers who are doing great things in the outdoors. I wanna give a special shout out to Mimosas here in Denver, Colorado, which is a black owned business. If you are ever here traveling to Denver, come check it out. Alex, what's the name of the other place again? Mood, Beats, and Potions. Moods, Beats, and Potions. So you also want to check out Moods, Beats, and Potions. And so before we get started today, I'm going to start and have each of the brothers here introduce themselves. And then we're, we're going to highlight Phil. I know I just put, I, I told y'all Phil's name. But we're, we're going to start the conversation off with him because he's the leader of Full Circle Everest. So we're going to start all the way to my right, right here with this good gentleman. Hey, what's up, y'all? Uh, Alex Bailey, founder and executive director of Black Outside Inc. Super excited to, to chop it up with Phil here. Yeah, Philip Peterson here, um, leader of Full Circle Expedition and founder of Full, uh, Full Circle Everest and founder of Full Circle Expedition. Glad to be here. Thanks, y'all. Yeah. Jerry James, we're many hats. So I uh, was together outdoors coalition lead for our creation roundtable. Also, the founder of the Explore Kentucky Initiative, and I'm also a freelance journalist. All right. So, fellas, just make sure we uh, project our voices. I want to be sure that uh, as we're doing a recording, the people in the audience can hear us. We're going to start off with Phil. So, we had a dope conversation earlier today at the outdoor recreation uh, convention that happens here. It's a trade show for people who work in the outdoors, who have businesses in the outdoors. And we talked about diversity and inclusion, specifically for Black folk reclaiming their space in the outdoors and I feel like Phil here is the epitome of that and he's going to talk to us a little bit about Full Circle Everest, the Full Circle movement and all of the things that you were trying to do with the group of brothers and sisters that you're leading up Mount Everest. Yeah. Thanks y'all. Um, you know Full Circle Everest expedition and Full Circle expeditions um, it was something that was you know born years ago years ago and it was born out of, again, lack of representation. And it wasn't something that I really thought about. And we didn't have these conversations yeah. 25, 30 years ago. It just didn't happen. And I didn't do it for that reason. I just found myself, I've always liked outdoors. And when I was eight, nine years old, I would go hiking and go fishing before going to play baseball or football. I do it all on the same day. And I was trying to bring my friends in at that time to go out and do these things. And they'll tell you right now that they're like, no, I'm not going to do that. But when I look at them now, they're like, man, you've been doing that since blah, blah, blah. And so way back then, I just realized that I was, I really enjoyed the outdoors. How I found the outdoors is another story. Mm. Um, Y'all want to hear that story? I want to hear that story. Yeah, we want to hear it. Let's, yeah. let's do it. Yeah. So when I was growing up, you know, I was born in 1962. I went to an all-Black school with an all-Black neighborhood in San Diego County. And when I was eight, nine years old, we moved to the suburbs. My dad bought a house, you know, because they allowed black people to buy houses back then yeah. in the suburbs. And so why he bought a house, I didn't really know at the time, but we moved, okay? Now I found myself going to an all white school with maybe five or six black people, you know, in the school itself. But I used to walk to school with rocks and golf balls in my pocket because people would call me niggas all day. And mm. I would throw rocks at them and throw yeah. golf balls at them. But I got tired of that. So I started taking the shortcut. Yeah. And the shortcut was where there were no houses, through the trails. Wow. And I started realizing that I was comfortable in that space. You know, you hear birds and you just notice different things. And so that's really how I found the outdoors back then, okay? not realizing where that would lead me. But then adolescence comes around. You, know, you get involved in different things, but also my parents got divorced mm. when I was 15, and we moved back to the other side of town. Okay. Now, I don't tell this story a lot, but people would try me, you know, and I'm not a violent person. Um, I mean, this was the this was the 70s, 80s in California, 
and some of my cousins, some of my friends were some of the biggest crips and gangsters in San Diego. But those were people I ran with at that time, 15, 16, 17 years old. So the outdoors kind of went that way. And fast forward, when I was in college, I played football and I fractured a vertebrae in my neck. And so football was taken away from me. So what people are going through right now with, with COVID, a, a life-changing experience, I went through that at 21 years old. Okay? So a year, a year and a half of disability had a lot of time to sit around and think, what am I going to do in life? But what I found out that life was short, just like people are thinking right now. So I'm going to do whatever it is that I want to, that I want to do. And so I went back to doing things in the outdoors. I was involved in a, a volunteer ranger program. I was leading interpretive hikes. And that's how I found out what a, a ranger was. I didn't know what a park ranger was. I didn't know what the outdoor industry was, but I went to go buy some boots in a North Face store. Because North Face was really the only company around about, you know, in the mid eighties, Marmot, maybe Sierra Design. But, um, and I asked the guy, how do you learn more of this outdoor stuff? And he gave me two telephone numbers. One to know, which was a National Outdoor Leadership School, and one to out with that. What those were, I didn't know. And I called and ordered the catalog. So internet didn't exist at that point. <laughs> so, so I ordered a catalog, and the nose catalog came in the mail first. And when I opened it up and looked at all these things that you could do in the outdoors, I was hooked. And so I hustled for two years. By that time, I was maybe 25. And I hustled for two years to save enough money to go take a nose course. I was working. So, at, so yeah. before you explain to the audience what NOLS is. NOLS is an outdoor education program that, for the most part, they run 30 day backcountry courses. And some of those courses are even up to three months long. And they can include hiking, uh, backcountry skiing, rock climbing, uh, whitewater rafting, kayaking, those kind of things. And so, I was hooked. Mm -hmm. That's what I wanted to do, right? But I was just going to take a leave of absence from my job. I was working at Costco at the time, was Christ Club. Okay? I was working there for almost nine years. So, so wait, you know, Costco so, before was Costco. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Wow. I didn't, yeah. I didn't know that. That's funny. Okay. <laughs> so I worked there and I was just going to take a leave of absence. So, and it's funny because to this day, there are still people who work in that same warehouse who still work in that same warehouse. And when I told them I was going to go and do something else, they're like, yeah, okay, okay, yeah, you're going to go do this. And when the time came, I was like, here's my two weeks notice, ciao, I'm out. And I got in my truck and drove to Landon, Wyoming, and uh, took this three-month-long course, which included hiking, rock climbing, uh, whitewater rafting, kayaking, and backcountry skiing. Mm -hmm. okay. Now, this was in the spring of 1992. Who knows what was going on in the in the, in the mid like mid spring of 1992 in our country? Was it LA? Was it Rodney? Rodney? Was Rodney King? Yeah. yeah, exactly. Rodney King, right? And so let's bring this full circle, right? That's Just a year ago, we would be looking at this same thing. Yeah. Almost 30 years for me, like getting into the outdoor industry. And so at that point, I had a choice. Mm. I remember I was in Red Rocks, Nevada, a very famous climbing area that people go climbing at. I was on a nose course when the Rodney King riots happened. And I had a choice to either leave that course and go home and make sure my mom was okay or stay. Like, well, you know, my cousins and so on, they're going to look after mom. So, all right, I'm just going to stay here and, and finish this course. And lo and behold, it has kind of pushed me to where I'm at today. So I remember, so y'all may not know this, but we had a panel discussion earlier. Uh, during today's conference and Phil was talking about how he met all of these people who are going to climb Mount Everest with him. So Phil, if you could retell that story about how you just, how your journey in life just took you into meeting all of these people who are going to climb the tallest mountain in the world. Yeah. Um, it, you know, really it's about opportunity. So mm -hmm. I was given an opportunity to experience, you know, working outside the country, right? Um, I worked with Conrad Anker, who was a, one of the famous American mountaineers. He gave me an opportunity to help volunteer and help train uh, people from Nepal who are high altitude mountain workers, predominantly Sherpas. 
And so I started with that program in 2006. And so that built a relationship with Conrad and I became. And I did that for a number of years, but in 2013, uh, I gotta go back a little bit. Go back. <laughs> 2012, after, after four or five years, Conrad said to me, he's like, man, we gotta get you on Everest with these guys. That would just be so cool because I had helped train these folks. And so 2012, actually, wasn't this outdoor retailer, but it was in Salt Lake at the time. And I come around a corner, I'm running to Conrad, and he says, yo, I put your name on an Everest permit for next year. And I said, okay, cool. All right. He said, you in? Okay, I didn't think anything of it. That was in the summer. At the winter show, we all met and it happened. So in 2012, I went to Everest um, as a part of National Geographic North Face. It was a commemorative climb for the first American expedition that had happened in 63. So I went on that expedition. The next year, 2013, Conrad actually called me and said, hey, I want you to be a part of this Denali expedition that is mentoring young people because he does a trip with one of his sons mm. and their friends. And that was Conrad Anchor, um, Jeremy Jones, John Krakauer, and myself who took a group of people on Denali uh, and just mentored them. They were good skiers, but they weren't mountaineers. They yeah. didn't have big mountain experience. So you say Denali. Yeah. And I think when I think Denali, I'm thinking about the SUV. <laughs> right? I think that's most black people think. When you think Denali, I'm thinking about the car. So like, what is, is it like the second largest mountain in the world or something? Like what is Denali? Denali is the tallest in North America. Okay. Okay. Right. Formerly Mount McKinley. Oh, right? that's what we would okay. say okay. Mount McKinley, but you know, our uh, first black president changed that shit. Yeah, because right. the so, colonizers changing right. it. Okay. So yeah. Lali in 2013, and that was running at the same time as another expedition that uh, one of our team members, well, actually two of our team members were on at that time. So we were on the mountain together. Okay. 2013, I actually moved to Chile. Mm. Okay. Um, I spent the next three years living in Chile. I was completely disconnected from the outdoor industry in the United States. Didn't go to outdoor retailer. I came home for maybe a month, and then I'd go back to and go, and go back to Chile. I moved back to the U.S. 2016. It took me about a year to get reconnected. 2017, and it really was here in Denver. Um, a friend of mine, Misha Charles, who invited me to come and do uh, a presentation for Black History Month about climate. And I walked into this room, and I was like, "Wow." all these people of color coming from where all these black folks come from because when i left in 2013 they didn't exist mm. okay and people started to oh they they knew who i was and i'm like how i'm, I'm just nobody and so i realized that i was now playing a part of inspiring other people to get outside okay fast forward another year or so and i was actually in ray ice park in in Rure, colorado and I was teaching a clinic and I just happened to turn around and I saw another brother. And I was like, yo, what's up? And so we speak to, we always do that. We like, yeah, what's up, you know, to show yeah, acknowledgement, you know. Yeah, especially at high school. Talk, right, especially yeah, at high yeah. school. <laughs> and so it was uh, Fred Campbell and we introduced each other and he said, Phil Henderson? I said, yeah. And he's like, can we talk to Conrad? And Conrad had been sending me emails to my old Knowles address, but I didn't work for Knowles anymore. So I didn't get him, but he had been talking with, with, with Fred and, and someone else about going to Everest, okay? Because a comrade and I had talked about it earlier. Mm. And so Fred and I are talking, and out of a corner of my eye, walks up somebody else, and it was Manoa. So Manoa is the youngest of our, of our climbing team. And so now here are three brothers in the back country. This is not even in the park. This is up the road, you know? And so Fred and Manoa have been climbing together, being mentored by Conrad same opportunities that he had given to me he was given to other people during this three-year period that i was out of the country and so we started talking and then it really kind of blossomed from that point and going down this path of building this other step tradition dom uh damon mullins he came into the he came into the uh into the, the picture and we talked about it a little bit and then the next year COVID happened mm. right everything Came to a halt. Okay. Two thousand. Uh, the next year, 2019, 2020, early 2020, I was back in 
you read? Going ice climbing. I was actually taking my daughter ice climbing. And we were in the hotel and I was taking my dog out to go use the bathroom. And there's another person and I look and it's another brother and he has his dog and our dogs are running around. I'm like, yo, what's up? And it was Eddie. And he's like, yo, I'm, I'm, I'm out climbing. So I'm like, cool. So something about ice climbing and brothers that we just, it just, it's like glue, yeah. something that like a magnet, whatever, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> and so Eddie and I connected. We went, we went our separate ways. We exchanged phone numbers. Later that year, Eddie and Manoa were climbing in Bozeman, Montana. And then Eddie and I got together. We talked and we went back country skiing. We spent the day together. And so I proposed the expedition to, to Eddie. And he was like, Man, this, I've never climbed with black people before. Mm. And I, you know, this would really, I, I would be excited to be a part of this expedition. So you know, I brought him on. Um, originally, when I wanted to put this expedition together, I wanted it to be new, gender neutral. I right? mm -hmm. wanted to have as many females as we had males on this trip. But finding black women with mountaineering skills was really hard. But I knew of Rosemary, who had been on expedition uh, on, on Denali three, four years earlier. And her and I also had been on, uh, on Kilimanjaro together as well in 2018. And so I reached out to Rosemary to pull her in. And it just really kind of went on from there. Um, James Mills, we went, we kind of went public at some point. Yeah. And with, with the expedition that was maybe uh, December, you know, January 2021. And it just resonated throughout the community and people really started reaching out. Yeah. You know? And so Thomas Moore somehow connected with me and Thomas is on the path and he's still on the path to climb the seven summits. Okay. So explain the seven summits. So seven summits are the highest mountains in the world on all seven continents. And uh, so he was on the path to climb the seven summits and he heard about this expedition and he kind of switched his script. He's like, well, I want to go with John. Yeah. And we vetted him. I talked with him a bit. He talked with some of the other team members. And through a question and answer conversation, what really brought him onto the team was, his answer was, I want to be a part of something that's bigger than myself. Mm -hmm. And so that really resonated with me because it's not, this isn't about me. It's not about just our team. It's about a whole movement and inspiring, not only black people, specifically black people, yes, but we inspire anybody to just get outside and do things in the outdoors, okay? And so we brought Thomas on. So that's really how the, how the team kind of came together with a little, you know, yeah. a few little changes here and there, but that's how it came together. Again, it wasn't like I went out and said, we're going to put a black team together to go climb out Everest because that would be dangerous. Right. These people all had the skills and knowledge, and it was a good next step for them as climbers and, and mountaineers, and it was a good step for me as the leader of an expedition and the leadership role because I had been in a leadership position for you know, 27 years, and I had already been on Everest as well. So, yeah. Yeah. so I, I think about what it means to be a Black person in a space where there's not a lot of Black people, and I think there's a lot of us who go through that experience, and I think it's important to recognize that, like, if you're on your journey and you're doing what you're supposed to do, you will find your people, right? And you never know how that will turn into something that's greater than who you are. I think it's interesting. What's the brother's name who was trying to do the seven summits? Thomas. So Thomas, like I, the way I think about it, right? You're doing the seven summits, like you're trying to be like, that's an individual accomplishment in some ways. But for him to say like, I want to be a part of this is special because it was bigger than what he was doing. And I think that that's something that's important, especially because we know sometimes when black folk are the only one, we get a little too comfortable being the only one, you know? Um, I also appreciate, and we talked about this earlier today, that you've done some of these things with your daughter, right? Yeah. And so could you talk about how you introduced her to the outdoors and the experiences that you've had with her, especially since you've been committed to like black women learning more about climbing mountains and things of that nature? Yeah. Um, Thomas Moore it's not just about her as well. It's, I mean, there's a lot of sacrifices 
that we make, y'all know that if you're in the outdoor space, you know there's sacrifices that you make. And I mean, I don't know, my, my daughter's my pride, but yeah. Anyways, my daughter has been, she was born into a lifestyle of being in the outdoors. Mm. Okay. This has been a lifestyle for me since since 1995, right? 97, something like that. And so when she was born, I was living in Vernal, Utah. Okay? And again, a space where there are very few black people. I mean, I knew maybe one or two other black people who lived in Vernal, Utah. Yeah. Okay? I lived there for 12 years. It's funny, my daughter says, now she doesn't really think about it, but she's Vernal, Utah is home for her. You know, where you're born, that's, that's home for yeah. you, right? And so she was born into a life of skiing, and I mean, I have pictures of her being in a, I used to put a, a sled, I put her in a crazy creek chair. If anybody knows what a crazy creek chair is, I would put her in a crazy creek chair. I made a sleeping bag that um, you could put your arms out, mm -hmm. you know? And so she could put her hood on and put her arms out and it had a little bag. So she was in this, sitting up in this sled and the dog, my dogs would pull this sled back. And she was one years old, even, even before one. She was on skis the first time when she was one years old. Um, I think she went climbing the first time when she was five. Um, she's been to Kenya twice. She's been to Nepal twice, and she lived three years in in Chile. Mm -hmm. Right. I, I mean, actually, I think Spanish is her first language because she went to kindergarten, first grade, second grade in public school in South America. Wow. Okay. And so when we moved back, you know, I'm always telling her, you, there, these are the things that I do, you have to do something. You know? <laughs> and uh, it wasn't just, you know, being on a computer or anything like that. You have to do things. And so nowadays, if she's 13, she doesn't really want to do those things as much because mm -hmm. of, you know, that age and so on. But she grew up doing these things and she does them at a, at a, a level that most kids her age don't do. Yeah. Yeah. And so I know that giving her that foundation, which is something that we don't really have. I didn't grow up without that, with that, yeah. that outdoor foundation. Nobody was giving that to me. And so that's important that not only do I give it to you all, but you have to start at home. And how many of y'all have, ki have kids at home? You know? Yeah, you see, y'all have kids yet, right? <laughs> um, but this is what happens is that in this, in this next generation, because y'all are in the outdoor industry and doing things in the outdoors, when you have children, I guarantee you that you will introduce your kids to these things at a young age. And that's how we start to flip the script and that we start giving them that foundation at a very young age that we didn't have. So that's why, I'm, I mean, I sit here proud to just be a part of, to even live through to this time, to see what y'all are doing. I won the game, you know, it, that game of life, but trying to find where, where, where I fit and, and being here with you all and seeing the things that you all, the opportunities that you have, I'm like, I stayed in the industry long enough to see that happen. So, you know, that's like, but yeah. That's good. That's good. And, and I, I, I think it's important uh, that we talk about the youth, just the black youth, right? Because we think about like physical activity, going outside, stereotypes like football, basketball, track. And interestingly, so part of my research as a scholar is on like the experiences of black folk in athletics. And what's interesting is, is that for black girls in particular, they have some of the least opportunities to experience being physically active and to go outside in a healthy way. And so I think Alex, um, if you could talk about the work that you're doing with Black children in trying to get them in the outdoors, in particular, talk about what you're doing with Black girls, and then I, I think you should talk about what you're doing with Black boys as well. Yeah, that means a lot, and I think the connection point real quick uh, is Philip and I actually met uh, at January 2020 yep. at Outdoor Retailer, <laughs> and I walked up to him, I was like going around telling people about Black outside, 
And it's like, I had like six people tell me, they're like, have you met Philip yet? I'm like, I don't know who this Philip person is. They're like, you got to meet Philip. So I don't know who it is, right? I didn't even know if it was a brother or not, to be honest. And then all of a sudden, Philip came out and always said, hey, I'm Philip. I heard you, uh, you're supposed to meet me. And uh, I was like, yeah, that's me. And so uh, he was really able to help us with some gear and to really expand our work. So it's so powerful thinking about what you said around that full circle piece, like the gear that you were able to help connect us with was able to help get more of our youth outdoors and to climb here into backpack here in Colorado with the same gear that you sent them, right? right? Just so that full circle is so powerful. So I just want to acknowledge that and hold that up. But uh, yeah, for us, um, I, I'm really inspired by Philip and think about like what it means for our youth to see, you know, especially for some of our younger black girls, black women climbing Everest, you know, we at Black Outside, we were able to revive America's first historically black summer camp for girls can't founder girls and what's powerful for those girls that they know they're stepping into a legacy. Um, that camp was started in 1924 uh, in San Antonio, Texas. Um, and it ran all the way through the 1960s. And unfortunately when the founder passed away, it ceased operations. And so um, after, you know, it ceased operations, it just, no one really heard much about it. Thankfully, there were a couple of folks and elders in our community that attended camp, kept these stories alive um, and we heard about it with Black Outside and uh, we were able to revive the camp. And so it's so powerful for our girls to A, know like at camp, when they go, they know the stories that way. It's like, I'm at a camp that's like started in the 1920s. And one of our elders, uh, Miss Gaynor, she comes to camp every year. Uh, she's in her late, I won't say her age, but <laughs> uh, when she comes to camp every year, she gives a whole hour presentation and she tells the girl, she's like, I remember I was hiking trails just like y'all. I was kayaking just like y'all. I was swimming in the river just like y'all. Uh, and she even told us last year, she's like, if it wasn't for my hip, I'd be swimming in the river with y'all, right? And it's so powerful to think about, again, I love what you said about Full Circle with her, like sharing those stories and our youth and our, especially our young girls know that our young campers. And so it's really powerful for me, especially as a black man, just knowing, thinking about gender, right? And how just seeing like young black girls feeling confident climbing if you're in Texas and Channel Rock, which is like this huge natural rock, or feeling comfortable just climbing in general, or feeling comfortable getting in the water and feeling like they matter in the outdoors. So I'm just super excited to see the ripple effects of what you're doing, especially with, uh, with black folks and inspiring more youth. Can I just throw something in there? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. I think when I was talking about sacrifices, and these are one of those things, even my daughter at this point is making that sacrifice. We live in, she was born in, in, in Vernal, Utah, and we live in Cortez, Colorado now. And she's never had the opportunity to go out and do things with other black girls. Oh, we, we got to send you the registration oh, no. link. You know, don't worry, yeah, yeah, we don't so, get to the camp. <laughs> you know, so again, that that's another full circle thing that I had to deal with that growing up. Now she deals with that mm -hmm. same thing growing up. But the fact that you all have these opportunities to provide young people a space where they can be with one another and support one another and do these things outdoors together is special, you know? Yeah. And those are the kind of things that we need to make sure we're pushing forward, you know? Yeah. And it doesn't mean that they have to be uh, uh, um, exclusive, but right. the fact that they can do those things in their home, in their communities and so on, and have access to that mm -hmm. is just important. Mm -hmm. yeah, very important, yeah. So we, we're wearing these hoodies <laughs> called Brotherhood. And so I actually met Alex at this, um, event he was hosting called the Brotherhood Summit. So Alex, talk about what you do with some of the black boys in the community where we live. Yeah, so we are uh, like relaunching a program. It was actually supposed to launch in 2020. Um, and it was originally called the Brotherhood Collective and we've changed the name to Brothers with the Land. Um, and what we realized is like, you know, in order some entry points for, especially some of our black boys really can center around thinking about how can we really find spaces for like identity development, reflection, uh, but then also like leadership pushes. And so we started off like, it wasn't even an outdoor engagement event. That's the one that where I met Brother Links in that. And uh, we were just like, let's get a bunch of black boys together. We'll bring in a hundred black men. We'll do some like programming. And man, our kids ate it up, right? They were just like, I've never had a space like this, especially in the city of San Antonio, yeah. where uh, we're, it's uh, the black population is 7%. Right. And so like it's rare for a lot of our black youth to be in a space that is predominantly black and catered for them. And so it started there. And what we realized after that, we're like, well, let's take a few of these boys on a camping trip. And man, we had this like powerful moment and like it almost brings me to tears when I think about it with we took and this is how Black Outside started. 
started with five kids that five youth. They started off at the brotherhood group. We said, you know what, let's take them out outdoors. And we took them to their first like car camping experience. Uh, we set them up with the headlamps. We go on this deep night hike. It's four miles, two miles in. They're already complaining, of course, right? Um, and we go to this overlook and we stop, right? And uh, we all just kind of pause and you can see, you know, they say the stars in Texas are bigger and brighter. And we look up and we're just like staring at the stars and all of us just get silent, right? And one of our other mentors says, he's like, man, y'all realize like these same stars are what our ancestors looked at. And they like fought so hard for you to be here and to feel free in this moment. And, you know, after that, it was just boom. Like all of us, right? You know, we're all crying. It was so emotional. And, you know, a lot of our boys today, most of them are in college, right? They're just like thinking like, man, that experience, just that entry point of being with people that look like them and connected in that way. Um, and so since that point, uh, what we've done is continue to expand that program. Night hiking is a big part, but we really center around identity, leadership, and challenge with our boys in a good way and healthy challenge. I'm um, really trying to expand what we call their imagination zones. So like one of the biggest ones, obviously, for some of our boys is like climbing. Uh, and they're like, I don't know about climbing. So it's like, you know, we're going to start off with just a little bouldering gym. And then we'll eventually put a harness on you, right? And like really trying to combat what does fear mean and being open and okay with saying, hey, I'm scared of this, but I'm going to try to work through and navigate that. I think that's so important. And that's what the work of that the outdoors does. <laughs> it teaches us so many valuable lessons. So tell the story of how Black Outside got their mascot. Oh, <laughs> the Black Bear story again? Yeah. Um, so it started off 10-year-old camper at camp, our first iteration, reiteration of Camp Founder Girls. And we did this whole drawing activity. We broke them into groups, your typical summer camp activity. Everyone had to choose an animal. And we get to the third group. I'll never forget, this camper, she walks up and she's holding this beautiful picture of a Black Bear. And we're like, okay, why'd y'all choose the black bear? And then she just looks and stops. She goes, well, of course they're black, right? <laughs> um, but then the second piece is she talked about how, like, she knew a lot about science. She loved science. And she was like, you know, for me, I think about how black bears are like black girls in, in the way society treats them. Everyone's really scared of bears, right? And she was talking about this as a 10 year old. She's like, people are scared of me because I'm a black girl, right? But in reality, she's like, black bears compared to other bears are some of the more like tame bears. They're herbivores, right? They really don't mess with people. They mind their business, right? And she's like, that's what I do. Uh, and that's what we do. And ever since then, that's been one of our adopted animals is the black bear. And we actually have a shirt, Camp Founder Girl shirt that's dedicated to the black bear. And we were hiking here in Colorado last summer. We talked with some of our youth about the story of how um, black folks throughout history, he's repping the brand. There is you this, go. Is this, is this there you go. Yeah, you can oh, find yeah, slim yeah, this slim Yeah, we'll drop the link in the chat at yeah, some yeah, point. Let me show the shirt. Yeah, all right. Uh, but we talked about how uh, Dr. Raylan Grant, you should definitely check out her work. She talks all about bears, uh, how black bears actually, um, there used to be folklore that black bears used to protect black people um, in the South. And so it was really powerful for our kids to be hiking and connect to that legacy and that, and that story and understand that like, oh, wow, like we have this place, we have this story in the outdoors. And again, I just keep, I keep shining you up because you're adding to the story and it's so powerful. And I'm just thinking literally now it's what, almost February, uh, five months from now, I'm going to bring another group, 15 kids here to Colorado hike and be able to tell them, Hey, guess what? I know the guy that I hike Everest. You can hike up the Rocky Mountains. Like, let's do this together. It's so powerful. So those stories, those interconnected stories are so powerful for us. So a a Alex and I, we're not, we're not family by, by blood. Um, we, we are family by proxy of the fact that I went to North Carolina Agricultural and Technical State University, the best university in the world. The best, the best HBCU in the world. His auntie, <laughs> Tina, is now my auntie because she went to a &T. And so with that being said, I want to bring in Mr. a &T himself, Ron Griswell. Yeah, Ron, yeah, don't put you on the uh, spot. Aggie pride. Yeah, Aggie pride. We got, we got, like, we got, like, three, four Aggies here. I, I met a whole bunch of, like, extended family just coming on this trip to Denver. And so I want to have Ron slide in maybe... What's oh, the best? Right here. Slide right here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm gonna have Ron. Ron no, right. I'm gonna have Ron slide in and talk a little bit about what he's doing with um, HBCU outside, and the work that he's doing with the youth that's just a little bit older than the youth that Alex is working with. That's a question. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah. 
No, uh, gosh. Uh, so I think the, the main thing for me is that you know, you know, with HBCs outside, uh, I just want to like bring it back to really quickly. I'm going to ask this in a very uh, political way. Speak up a little bit. <clears throat> you got me in my like quiet storm voice. Uh -oh. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> 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 I'm chill, but no, uh, you know, in a very like you know political way, it's just like you know, how I'm gonna ask the question, but at the same time, is I want to reconnect with something that we've been talking about this whole time, especially around the full circle movement, you know, uh, that you know Phil is involved with, and I feel like we've all had this full circle feeling or moment in all of our lives. Ooh. I constantly preach and talk about me becoming the person that I needed to be for my younger self. Mm -hmm. That's full circle moment. And through HBCUs outside, through what I've been able to accomplish in watching uh, mainly one of my students right now, Adrian Wilson at FAMU, it's this full circle moment. I left my university, ANC State University, because of the lack of resources they had in regards to the outdoors. I needed to go find these things. And now I'm looking at the situation as what I've been able to help put, you know, the help put Adrian in these certain situations where he's now been able to do a nose course and, and hike in Alaska for, for, you know, for a month and, and backpack and, you know, learn from all these uh, beautiful experiences and be able to help lead his group uh, at, at uh, FAMU. And for me, that full circle moment is what it's all about. Mm. And I constantly tell people it's about me personally becoming the person I needed when I was younger. And that's the the, the selfish story of, of HBCs outside yeah. and that I'm providing the resources that I wish was available when I was in college. Yeah. So, yeah. Okay. Now, we, we spoke, we, we all spoke a little bit earlier and, and Ron, I want you to go, go back even further. Like little kid, um, North Carolina, and like, what's your experience in the outdoors growing up? God, my experience in the outdoors growing up, um, I tell people my earliest memory of the outdoors, my family was big on road trips, big on road trips. I always, I always remember the road trips, but the earliest memory is of the first road trip I remember. We were driving alongside some road. I didn't know the point, uh, what time it was. I'm in a car seat. That lets you know how young I am. You remember that? I remember that. <laughs> I remember that. I remember it because of the frustration. And I felt frustration mm -hmm. because we got to the certain point. I remember looking out the window, and there's this rolling green, blue map. And I'm just like, what is that? I need to see that. Yeah. And I remember this seatbelt being like, nah, bro. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to, I remember the frustration of being in this seatbelt, not necessarily being able to, to mm. see and look out the window mm. all the way, but I remember those blue and green rolling mountains. I remember years later, I asked my mom, it's like, hey, like, I remember we went here one time and I was like really frustrated. I was young. What was that about? She was like, well, we let you out of the car. And, you know, you, you saw what we were looking at, but we were on the Blue Ridge Parkway, you know, and that was, you know, we were looking out at the Smokies. And so that is one of my earliest memories of the outdoors. And I remember in that moment, other than frustration, the other thing I felt was this, I don't know, it's like I immediately got attached to whatever that was. Mm. I was, and ever since then, it's been chasing that feeling that I felt from seeing those mountains. Not necessarily saying I have to always be in the mountains, but that feeling of wonderlust, that feeling right. of there's something beautiful out there for us all to experience, you know? And so that was the very, that's one of my very earliest memories. And other than that, though, I grew up in the country. I, yeah. I grew up at grandma's house. I, I grew up, you know, my parents' house. Uh, you know, we had a couple acres. My grandparents had a couple acres. That's the country lifestyle, you know, is uh, chasing or playing with farm animals and running in the field, uh, doing tick checks, make sure you're good. And um, that that was life growing up, yeah. you know, mm -hmm. honestly, running outside, playing tag, hide and go seek, uh, playing with insects, frogs and things like that. 
So it's always been a part of me. The outdoors is ingrained in me, even though the activities I was doing at the time may not necessarily be what people think about when they think about the outdoors. So, oh, you're playing tag outside, you're doing hide and seek, you know, playing with insects. So these are very outdoor experiences. Right. But the way we think about it outdoors is more so climbing mountains, white water yeah. rafting. You know, it, it's these like very high level activities. Yeah. These are definitely outdoors, but the outdoors is so much more accessible than that. And my whole life has been outdoors. So I like, I wrestle with, I wrestle with some tropes we use in diversity and inclusion. And one of them is urban, mm. right? Talk about it. Like we use urban, like we use urban to describe black people. But think thinking about like where my mother grew up, if I'm being honest, where I grew up in New Jersey, which is a mostly white town, really like what town? It was mostly a white town. It was a white town. I, I live in Jersey. Oh, for real? Yeah. I lived in you know where Plainsboro is? I did. Plainsboro? Like, yes, the town, name of the town Plainsboro. So, you know, <laughs> um, the um, sound right, right, right. like it was it, it was sub it was it was suburban, right. but it was definitely farms yeah. there. Like you know what I'm saying? It was kind of country when I think about it. So like we 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 take this label of country, I mean of urban, and we put it on black people in terms of DNI, and it's very limiting, right? And so. And I, I sometimes think even the way like we might perceive someone having come from an HBCU as being city, the way we think about hip hop is very city, right? It's not very country. So I, I think there's, there's great value in the story that you told and the stories that all of you are telling about like our connection to the outdoors isn't necessarily about all of these concrete jungles that we live in, you know? Um, Ron, I'm going to ask you to put your, your lens on, like, looking into the future, much like I did earlier today. And, but I'm going to change the question up, right? Imagine that you're talking to, that we're the board of directors of North Carolina a and mm. and Chancellor Martin is there. Like, what's, what's your ask? Like, what do, you, what do you want, what do you want HBCU outside to be at an HBCU? And let, let's just pretend it's a and Wow. No pressure. What a question. <laughs> what a no question. What a question. Oh. Mm. You really got me with that one, man. Take your time. <laughs> There's some A and T alums on the that, so one of my main asks from a and in that particular situation, this theoretical situation. <laughs> it might happen, yo. It, it, it's gonna definitely happen. Okay. But Claim it. it's gonna, I'm manifesting it, brother. That's what we need. But uh, one of the main asks, I am asking for the university to give the students a chance to open their eyes and try something different, step out of their comfort zone. Mm -hmm. You can find stepping out of your comfort zone in a whole bunch of things. I mean, come on, it's college life. Yes, you know, right. you're these, a lot of these students for the first time are by themselves, quote unquote, away from family. So yes, all those challenges and those things exist there just in existing on campus. But to add in connecting students through that medium of the outdoors as a completely different element to it. I'm asking for the people, the leaders that be in charge of these institutions say, hey, take a chance on your students for them getting outside for better their health, better their mental and physical health at that. Mm -hmm. We often don't talk about the, the ailments <laughs> in the, within the black community yeah. that mm -hmm. plague HBCUs because right. they are predominantly black. We don't talk about the mental issues because it's something that's still distant from us or we like to keep ourselves distant from because it's type we would talk about. Because normally it's just you need to go talk to God. Yeah. <laughs> it's yeah. a mental health issue, you know? Mm -hmm. So there's those kind of issues there. But then there's also we want to put better humans on the planet for a better planet. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about the condition the planet is in and how simple outdoor programs can mold stewards of the environment. That's right. That's good. That is just a very simple piece. We want stewards of the environment. 
Don't you want students to walk by and pick up just a piece of trash on the lawn right there on your campus? Let's start right there. We don't have to talk about cleaning up the Mississippi or the Ganges or the Amazon River. Let's start right there. Just picking up a piece of trash right there on campus. Let's create stewards of the environment right here on your campus. And they're going to take this wherever they go into the world. Those are the main things for me, man. That's good. Um, there's, a, um, there's a brother named Robert, Robert Boulard. Boulard. He's like the father. He's like literally, it's a black dude. He's the father of the environmental rights movement. And he's at Texas Southern University at an HBCU. And I just wonder, and I, this is not my area of expertise, but I wonder how much like environmental rights advocacy is connected with getting black people outside. You know what I'm saying? And maybe that's a good segue. Jerry, hey, I'm hey. gonna throw that to Jerry. I didn't, I, didn't, I didn't even know that was gonna be the second, but that's a hell Mary. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah, like this is a <clears throat> big topic for me. Um, so, like my buckets of like in this work is around education and um, technical um, certifications. So, like I'm an ACA instructor, American Canoe Association instructor, certified in canoeing, kayaking, and paddleboarding. Yeah, you know, I can say. <laughs> but um, environmental, I think it's intrinsically linked. Like um, I always tell people the story. I go out paddleboarding and whitewater all the all the all the time. And so, like Louisville, Kentucky, um, there's the Ohio River. I love the Ohio. It's a big, mighty river, tons of barges, and it has. I grew up. I lived as a military brat, so I lived New Jersey, kind of by the ocean, and I love the beach and I love like big turbulent water. So being in Kentucky, we're landlocked. So the Ohio gives me that. On the west end of Louisville is where the predominantly black community is. Um, there, up until 2019, there was no water access to access the Ohio. On the east end, there was, there is rowing the Louisville Rowing Club, Boat Club, Yacht Club, all that stuff. And that's where I would go and launch my kayak and sea kayak and go all that stuff. And this was like by design, you know? So if you read books like Color of Law by Richard Rothstein, Landscape Exclusion by William O'Brien, you will learn that they, it's interesting in William O'Brien's book, when they were developing like a lot of like outdoor resources and parks, they would say like, it was this really, this quote that stuck out to me. It said, people of the Negro race, they just like to be jovial and have ball pit, ball, ball fields and barbecue pits. That's all they need. The Negro is a jovial creature loves being around and kind of like shucking and jiving. But then it said people of the Nordic like descent need trails and mountains for their vigor. And this is at this like state parks development conference in the 1920s. So these are the people, the fathers of like state park and the, you know, kind of like park space movement. And they're designing these infrastructure and they didn't, they just didn't design with us in mind. So I kind of, my love, my research is around landscape architecture and inclusive design. So I kind of dig back in the crates and, and like I always tell the story. Um, I One of the big projects that I work on is, friend. I work with a group called Friends of Cherokee in Kentucky. So can, Cherokee State Park was Kentucky's first and only state park for black people. And it, and it was like it, the only part we go to, go to in the Jim Crow era. So up until like the mid sixties and <clears throat> It's uh, it's interesting that these like spaces like exist. You know, like think about this. Like in Kentucky, you have Carter Caves, really beautiful geological area, Natural Bridge State Park, all these cool spaces. Kingdom Come, that's up on Pine Mountain. It's really scenic, but you could just go to one space, and you it was in a sundown town, a sundown county. So like, what's a sundown town? What's a sundown town for people who don't know? So sundown town was uh. It was either by de jure or de facto policy that black people had to be out of town by dark. It was essentially like you could go and the black people could go in the town and work, work in the white people's houses, do you know do the job, but then they would go to like a settlement outside the city, and it's because they said that we were like dangerous at night. And so in the, some of these communities, it's, I'm also going to shout out books. Is there's a book called Sundown Towns, hidden mention of American racism, where these towns would have signs that actually say it. <laughs> <laughs> like that told you get out by dark and so anyways I worked with the friends of Cherokee and it was just interesting that when you talked about environmental justice and all stuff like that and about your, your camp these stories get lost 
you know, to, to, to time. And um, with the Friends of Cherokee, it's like interesting that it closed in the 60s. And when desegregation was happening, and I don't know where I'm going with the story, but I just want to tell it, but when desegregation happened, there's a, there's a nearby white park called Ken Lake. So on one side of the bay, there's Ken Lake. On one side, there's Cherokee. Separate entrances so the white people don't interface with the black people. When it closed, when desegregation happened, they decided to cho close Cherokee. And then Ch Ken Lake absorbed Cherokee. Then they floated eight out of eight out of ten of Cherokee's cabins to Ken Lake. <laughs> and then it sat dormant, this 300 acre park. And it was pristine. Like people, if you Google it or research it, black people from like New York, all around the country came to Cherokee because it was like you could have your boat there, all, all that stuff. And it just was lost to history for like so many years. And so I've been working with uh when I was in like high school, this and it was like in the early 2000s or so, this organization was formed, Friends of Cherokee, and they lobbied the state of Kentucky to revitalize the lodge. So they invested $600,000 to revitalize the lodge. And then the organization went dormant. And then I've been working with them on, we just did a trail building project to honor the first superintendent of the park, Coach Lester Mims. And when you talk about environmental justice and like our connection outside, it's like just interesting about like how doing this, how limiting it was for yeah. us. And it was by like freaking design. I always tell people that like we weren't allowed to go to like the certain river access point. I talk about also um, Eugene, I think it's, um, do y'all, have y'all familiar with the, the early 1900s Chicago race riots? Some of it. So I forget the kid's last name, but his kid, uh, it was a hot summer in Chicago, Lake Michigan's there. Him and his boys, like we were chilling here. We we're like, it's hot. We're gonna get some logs and we're gonna make a raft. So Eugene, he's a kid, he makes a raft. And I might cry because it's a sad story, but he makes a raft, puts it on the lake and he goes floating. And he accidentally drifts to the white side of the beach and somebody chuck rocks at him and he ended up drowning. And the police didn't do anything about it. And it was like, and so it's, it's like interesting, like when we talk about environment, it's very, it's, mm -hmm. it's intrinsic. So I, I hearing, hearing that story, and you, you talk about policy. Yeah, that's good. It, it makes me wonder how, how much as, as black folk have we had have we allowed or had our identities bound by the limitations of policy? You know, because you know, I always hear like, you know, black people don't go outside. Well, why not? We just don't do that. You know, like it's so it's interesting. I'll share a little bit about me. It's like when you when I hear that, I always that wasn't my narrative growing up. Mm. So I grew up as a military brat. So my and I also served in the Air Force with the S 16s and I, I loved it. But I grew up in a military base and I had like a lot of privilege. I was actually talking to my dad on the phone the other day because he was like, he was like, man, you're really doing it. Cause like on the base, I remember like Fort Monmouth, it's a really beautiful space. So like, there's like the ocean, like there's a bay here that goes to Lake Ocean. And then we had this like street, Goslin Avenue. At the end of the street, we had the, the base fitness center that had like world-class fitness, like pool, freaking gym parade fill with running tracks, pool up bars behind our housing area. We have basketball court, little trail system. And then we had this, there's an organization on military base is called Morale Welfare Recreation. So we, you could check out backpacks, do all that stuff. And then my dad, like your like family, he's a rule from rural Virginia. He was baptized on the river, that one in the river, he learned to swim all that stuff. So that wasn't like my mm. like narrative. I had that privilege of having that. And so like, but it, the identity, that it was when I was on the base, I felt like normal. But then when I went to school, got off the base and went, you know, in the civilian world, then there were those tropes. Mm. And there was a lot of like black people that didn't have the same privilege or because of like, you know, systemic racism where they were in a community where they were, didn't have the same trails and stuff. They, and so it's, it's just different, different for me. So from a policy perspective, like, what does reparations look like for Black people getting outside or having full exposure to the outdoors? I think 
<laughs> it's a lot. I mean, I just wrote for, for my mm-hmm. job, like uh, with ORR, Outdoor Creation Roundtable. I lead Together Outdoors, and we wrote, I wrote a <laughs> Department of Interiors doing like a uh, deal that's called Advanced and Racial Equity in Department of Interior Sites. So I wrote a letter as part of it. It's in, you can go, y'all can go read it. It's in the federal register. I think like reparations looks like um, transit the trails programs. Like Senator Cory Booker, he introduced a bill called Transit the Trails. And so like, if you look at where like national parks, state parks and stuff are, it's like way away from population centers. Even like in like Kentucky, like there's this really cool public private park called Park of Fort Fort. And it's, it's a park that protects the Floyd's Fort watershed. Um, and it has a downhill mine, mountain bike park and it's just cool. I love going there. There's no tarp, which is a public um, like transit that mm-hmm. goes there. So I think reparations looks like making sure that there's like access to those spaces. I think also reparations looks like it's funny you said reparations, but I like that. It looks like equipping people with the technical skills to because like for me like like a lot of y'all I'm the OG in my state. Mm. So when people need like I've paddled like I, I've done paddled 255 miles down the Kentucky River for this event called the KR 255. It's a race event. So I did it in, in a three-man canoe within like 83 hours. I've paddled from Cincinnati to Louisville 120 miles. So I've done all these like long distance paddling stuff. So people like call me up or my buddy Jacory. Me and him are the only like black certified canoe like folks in Kentucky. But I'm like, I don't want to be that. And so I think like the government needs to invest in helping with experiential education mm. to certify people, do the, you know, AMGA, American Mountain Guide Association, do the ACA, you know, and stuff like that. That's what's up. I, uh, I appreciate all of you, you sharing here today. As, as someone who's an educator, and Phil, you talked about this earlier, you said, you said one, of, one of the ways that you think about your identity is as an outdoor educator. Right. And it, it, from that policy piece, like maybe there needs to be like some standards in the way that we we educate our children about like, yo, y'all need to spend some time outside because they because even the technology has made things different. Like kids don't go outside anymore. You know what I mean? Like I, we was walking over here. We see no kids outside throwing snowballs. Anything. Yeah. And it's weird. <laughs> you know? it's, it's, weird kid, it's like weird. Like kids like yeah. don't like P.E. Yo, I, I have lo- a PhD love, in physical education I and I don't get PE. it. Yo. I don't get it, yo. <laughs> Kids don't like PE no more. It's weird. I like. Well, you know what? We're moving into a digital landscape. Right. But the kid, the parents don't like PE. That's true. The parents don't get outside. Yeah. So hmm. the kids don't get outside, that's and that's true. why I have that. When you think about having that outdoor lifestyle, and we can all adopt that. What does what what, what does getting outside mean? Right. Yeah. Yeah. Does it mean yeah. climbing? Yeah. Does it mean? Yeah. So it, for me, even right now, it was a conscious decision when I moved back to the U.S. that I need a piece of land. Freezes, right? So I have three acres at home. So when we get up in the morning, you know, I can watch the sunrise and listen to birds. Uh, I have a greenhouse where I grow my own food. I have goats at home. Uh, I have apple trees. You know, so to bring people into that space and let them know, I mean, you don't even you don't need all that, right? You can grow a tomato plant in a pot, right? And so. One of the things that I think we don't see is how resourceful we can because we've been removed from that yeah. so mm-hmm. much. So when we talk about reparations, mm-hmm. so I mean we talked about this earlier, and I think that one of the things that our government, probably the biggest thing our government can do, is allow any black person to go to the airport, get a ticket, and go to Africa. Because exactly. then you will see like what you have been removed from. Mm-hmm. I understand what I'm saying, and. We're in the environmental movement, but we've just been removed from it. Yeah. Right? We're all connected to the natural environment. We've just been removed from it. But when we see folks that look like us, so when I went to Kenya, again, I didn't know what it, before I went, I didn't know what a, uh, what a park ranger was until I started going to parks, man. Right? But I never saw one that looks like me. Do y'all know who um, 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 Shelton Johnson is? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay, you know Shelton Johnson. Now, that is another brother who has stepped into that space. And how he did it, I don't know, because I call it a monkey suit, right? That green, you know, suit that people wear at national parks. It just oh, doesn't, yeah, it just yeah. doesn't buy, you know? We, 
but, I, mean, I got something to say about that. <laughs> when I went to, but when I went to, when I, when I went, when I went to Kenya and I started seeing that all the park rangers, the guides, the people who work for Kenya Wildlife Service were all black and they wear that green suit. So then it flipped and I'm like, well, I could see myself doing that mm. and being amongst those people. Right? Okay. And so when we see that, um, you know, we, people just go and dig in the dirt, they're still growing their own food. And so, I mean, I'm going to make myself own one. I don't even know how this happens, but my father's second wife, you know, and I, we talk about her like, a, anyway, when someone says, where those eggs come from? If they don't come from the store, I don't eat it. How do we get to that? How does a person get to that point? Yeah. You know, where if it doesn't come from the grocery store, that is not good for you. Mm -hmm. yeah. So we need to, to, to teach our children that you can take care of yourself and being a part of the land doesn't mean being in the outdoors doesn't mean going and climbing. So that's what I did, but I don't expect everybody to do that, right? But then there's another side that people don't see. I'm just as, I'm just as happy digging in the dirt and growing my own food as I am going climbing. Sometimes I'd rather stay at home and you know, <laughs> do that, you know? But that's the thing. It doesn't have to be in what our society says yeah. is being a part of the outdoors. Yeah. Yeah, I was, I was just going to build on what you said, like with my work, like I've been like a journeyman in Kentucky and it's great to finally meet like all, as I've heard about all y'all, because it's like, I'm in like Kentucky and I feel like very isolated, mm -hmm. but I like look at like, and I'm like, I want to be in a space with all y'all Sunday and it's great to be here. But um, like in my state, like I started a brand called Explore Kentucky and it promotes outdoor creation around the state. And exactly what you said was like people in kentucky have this inferiority complex we don't have the mountains of colorado and all stuff but what i did was like yo we have like the river gorge we have all these cool places and like let's enjoy them and then like i started building like little trips and stuff that people could go on and it and i, I just think that's important to like not make it because like so much of the outdoor industry is focused on like what i call hard outdoor recreation mm -hmm. they're like soft skills soft things that you can do that are just as freaking rad you know so that's in that elitism. Focus. Yeah, yeah. And, yeah. And, and that's but for the longest time, that's what's been what what drove brands to associate themselves mm -hmm. with other people. There's nothing necessarily wrong with it because we we have someone right here like he's a phenomenal mountaineer. Yeah. At the same time, when brands specifically focus on that, they they erase the experiences of a lot of us who yeah, I just like to get outside and barbecue. Yeah, and there's I just like to get outside and do my garden. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and those are still outdoor activities. Those are yeah. still outdoor things. And those are things that should be celebrated. I think is in a, in a poll, I think here's a cool exercise that I want y'all to do as we go home. Fire Google Maps. So fire Google Maps and do some inventory. I do like a lot. I love, love maps. So I created this map um, a few years ago to kind of, because like, you know, the whole thing about black people can't swim. There's that whole trope and all stuff. And like, people don't realize like, because of access so i mapped uh, i got these like shape files from the university of louisville so it tells you like income levels and racial uh, race demographic so i put that where on a map and in, in red then i put like more fluid parts of town so i start building these layers and then i chrono i like identify where pools were and you start to see a trend in the more fluent areas tons of pool access mm. for the in the more like you know the more black and brown more lower income like one or two, if that, mm -hmm. and a lot of them close, and a lot of them have been replaced with like splash parts. So like I, I challenge y'all to create a map like that, or create a map of like where you're predominantly low income, or you know communities of color, and then inventory like your uh, outdoor assets, your green spaces, and you'll see that there's that there's policy in place on why there's a disconnect. You know, I would add to that too. Even sometimes, even for youth asking them like sometimes i just ask like especially kids growing up on the east side of san antonio i'm like oh where does when was the last time you swam and where and so many of our kids in our community were like oh i swam at the boys and girls club going to find out they closed the pool at the boys and girls club on the east side so then it's like well that was the main vehicle for many of our youth to experience water and the irony of like the black people don't swim thing i know at camp we have to like pull our campers out of the water they love the water like they're just in there all day and so it's funny how like i just think we talked about like the tropes right like if you walk into camp founder girls 
like so many of those strokes to be challenged just like that. Mm -hmm. Like having some of our counselors in training walk around. It's like, oh yeah, last summer I was backpacking in Colorado and having lifeguards who are black and all those things and just challenging those narratives. So, you know, I think one, uh, you know, I would add to that too, just asking the question of like elders and also youth too, like where, where did you find these connections, right? And do they still exist in those connections? If they don't, you know, that's another policy thing that we've got to like really push our local leadership and state leadership on too. That's something this community in Northern Kentucky reached out to me. They said, Jerry, because I help whenever there's like an environmental justice thing, people call me like they're someone's trying to build a conveyor belt. Like two years ago, this neighbor association, some of this mining company was trying to build a conveyor belt over the Kentucky River. And they're worried about if the limestone fall off the conveyor belt and could like harm like paddlers and stuff. Mm -hmm. And so like I wrote a letter to the Kentucky non coal mining that spoke. And then for this, like this city the, the city voted to shut down the pool and so I gave I was like look I got this new job but I can't I can't fully dive into this campaign with y'all hey everyone thank you again for your support of entrepreneurial appetites black book discussion beginning this season we are inviting our listeners to support the show through our patreon website the founding 55 patrons will get live access to our monthly discussions for only five dollars a month your support will help us hire an intern or freelancer to help with the production of the show. Of course, you can also support us by giving us five stars, leaving a positive comment, or sharing the show with a few friends. Thank you for your continued support.